Six years ago, we published an article in Stanford Social Innovation Review around collective impact, and we're delighted but also quite surprised that this idea of collective impact took, in particular, the nonprofit world in the United States by storm. Across the country, there has been an incredible energy around this idea because many of the organizations that have been working on complex social problems, problems like poverty, problems like poor educational systems, poor health systems, problems like juvenile justice, and yes, environmental problems as well, have gotten a new energy around taking a new approach to, take, to solving these problems. A few years ago, along with the Aspen Institute, we created something that's called the Collective Impact Forum, and there are now 15,000 members of the Collective Impact Forum that are on a regular basis sharing their experiences about how they are using collective impact to solve problems. This is enormously important because 150 people within FSG cannot figure this out. So the fact that there are now thousands and thousands and that this community is together learning about how to apply collective impact is very important. So to start out, I think it's important to clarify what we're talking about. When FSG talks about social problems, we frequently like to distinguish between problems that are simple, problems that are complicated, and problems that are complex. Simple problems you can solve because you can follow a recipe, a receta. And if you follow the recipe every time, you will always come up with the cake. And I think actually Vidal talked about this, that it, sometimes it's simple to follow a recipe. But that doesn't work with complicated problems. It's not easy for anyone to pick up a book like they can a cookbook and figure out how to send a rocket to the moon. That being said, even though it's complicated, even though it's very hard, even though it may take years to figure it out, once it's been figured out, once you've figured out the vaccine, how to create a vaccine to cure a disease, there is a process that you can continue following. And that will work for solving complicated problems. Where the world gets into a lot of difficulty, a lot of problems today, is that they are treating complex problems as complicated problems. What that means is that people think that if we devote enough dollars and enough research to find a technical solution to a problem like why young children do not succeed in school, or why health systems are not enabling the poor people of the world to, to live healthy and fulfilling lives, or a problem like creating water security for communities and regions. When we think that this is a complicated problem and not a complex problem, we find mistakes. We make mistakes. And we waste money, and we waste time, and we're not able to solve the problem. There is a grave danger that people, in their eagerness to find a solution that is scalable and replicable, will treat the problem of water security as a complicated problem instead of a complex problem. Complex problems are different because they are always changing. The context is different. And you can have all the different, all the different circumstances, all the context be the same in terms of the technical problem, in terms of the values that are involved, but just the fact of having a mining company that may have violated the trust of a community 20 years ago can completely change the dynamic of what you need to do to create something like water security. If we are not mindful of that difference, we will fail in this effort, and this is very important to keep in mind. So let me talk a little bit about collective impact. This you know, this is why water security is, is so com complex, right? It is about a need to protect the, the means for people to have uh, well-being in their lives, human well-being, access to water so that they can live their lives well. It's a matter of protecting the ecosystems. It's a matter of creating resilience around problems that may emerge. It's a matter of creating the dynamic that allows companies to succeed in their environment and to build economic development as well. So oftentimes, in, in this space, the typical interventions, and I'm not talking about water funds right now, I'm talking about typical interventions, those are limited in their ability to solve the problem. These things are important. Issues about creating the right sorts of pricing for water, this is important. 
It's important to have the right kind of infrastructure investment for sure. It's important to think about rationing during certain times when a, 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 a crisis occurs. But these solutions alone will not solve the problem. It needs to be much more than that. And we believe that collective impact holds great power for the issue of water security. And this involves many of the things that the water funds are already doing. It's around creating alignment across sectors. It's around recognizing that no individual sector will be able to, to solve the problem since no one individual organization is causing the problem. And I love the point that was made earlier about um, the need for governments to governar con um, this idea of governing with the people. And I think it's critical in keeping that in mind. It's not just the government that needs to lead and govern with, but all of the leading institutions, whether it's companies or NGOs or other authorities, also have to recognize the importance of governing with. So let's talk a little bit more about collective impact. What's a bit different about collective impact is that it provides a highly structured process for creating a different level of cross-sectoral alignment, which at the core has at part of it a common agenda and one where there is a different and a differentiated and a distinct level of trust among actors, which is often hard to find in this space. So in our res research around collective impact, and we've researched hundreds of organizations that are working on collective impact, we found that there are five critical elements. Common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, the backbone support. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about these different elements. The first is the notion of common agenda. And people are surprised continually when we will often say, this process of creating a common agenda may take as long as a year to get to, depending on the circumstances. And people will say, well, how can you mean that? Why does it take us a year to get to a common agenda? We all agree that water security is important. We all agree that educating our children is important. We all agree that eradicating poverty is important. But when it comes down to it, these words mean very different things to different organizations. And success in this common agenda means, means very different things for different organizations. And so unless there's an effort to tease out what those differences are and openly communicate those differences, then eventually down the line, there will not be trust, there will not be collaboration, or it will be very limited as those individual groups pursue their, their interests. Shared measurement is the notion that if you have a common agenda, there needs to be agreement on what are going to be the markers that you are succeeding in what you're trying to do. If you don't have that agreement around shared measurement, what you're going to track, why you're going to track it, what will constitute success, that means that you cannot have a data-driven conversation about whether you are succeeding or not. So that ends up being important. One of, for, for purposes of time, I'm, I'm going to skip the continuous communication. I think that one's clear. But I do want to emphasize this notion of the mutually reinforcing activities and the backbone support. So we all know that in any kind of collaboration, there's need for there to be complementary activities, not, not just have people working in silos, of course. But what's different about collective impact is that when there is a level of trust, when there is an urgency around change, when there is truly an acceptance of a common agenda, then the organizations that are working on these problems, the experts that are all well-intentioned and all have great years of experience and success in what they're doing, they're willing to make compromises in what they do so that together they can solve the problem better together. This doesn't mean that they do the same things, they're doing different things based on where their, to their expertise lies, but there need to be adjustments in what they're doing and so that the whole has more power than the individual parts. That's the idea about the continuous communication. The idea of the backbone support, this may be the most important part of this at all. Collective impact does not succeed unless continuously there's an effort to expand the number of entities and organizations and people and communities that are involved in solving the problem. And if there's not a continuous effort to increase trust among these groups, this is the role of a backbone organization. It needs to be independent. It cannot sit within a government. 
It cannot sit within a company. It needs to be independent. It can be financed by government. It can be financed by a company. But it needs to be independent because the, all the actors need to recognize that it does not have its own agenda for success. That backbone organization needs to focus on building that trust and communication as the group's working together. So let me, I want to give you an example of how collective impacts work so, so that you can see it. And I'm using uh, an example that FSG worked on recently. It's not in water, but bear with me because I think that there are some important parallels to, to recognize. So, um, in the issue of early childhood education, early childhood success, which I think we all can agree is a complex problem, a group came together in Houston, Texas to focus on how they could work together to change things in Houston. We're talking about over 150 people. This is including government leaders. This is including business leaders. This is including the leaders of schools, the leaders of universities, the leaders of foundations, the leaders of nonprofits, and very importantly, people on the community level together. They came together to, to, to see if there was a way that they could work in a different way to change the lives of children ages zero, zero to eight in Houston. And together, in, this is last year, Early Matters worked on developing its common agenda. So I want to read this vision, because the vision is important and the goal is important. And then we'll talk a little bit about how it works. So the vision that they came up with is, we envision a greater Houston region where young children are a part of supportive and nurturing families and are able to participate in high quality early education knowing that intentional early investments significantly improve kindergarten readiness, third grade reading mastery, high school graduation rates, post high school education, and workforce readiness. You can see how it impacts the entire community. We're not just talking about children. And so their goal was that by 2025, all students in the greater Houston area will be reading at or above grade level by the end of third grade. This is a very ambitious goal. And then they identified these are the areas, these are the strategy areas that would allow them to make progress in achieving this goal. So the quality of early childhood education, the level of family support and education that's happening in the home, the extent to which kindergarten and third grade teaching is improving, legislative and other policy that encourages us to work, and health system support, recognizing that as a complex problem, issues of health often get in the way. So, Take a look a little bit about how this works. In order for, for collective impact to work, there needs to be a steering committee that's thinking about this at the top, that has representation from all the different groups that are, are concerned about this issue. Leaders, of, as I mentioned before, the private sector, public sector, community groups as well. And then they focus on different thematic areas and have working groups that focus on the different areas, as, was, as they decided as far as their strategy is concerned. And you can see, in this diagram on the slide that they recognize that in order to have an impact at changing a systems-based problem, a complex problem, they need to tackle the problem at many different levels. They need to tackle the problem at a family level. They need to tackle it in terms of the service provider level. But that's not enough. They need to tackle it at the educational system level and the overall policy level. You can think about how this might apply for water security as well. You have to tackle it at the user level. That means individual families, but it also means companies, how companies are using water. You have to think about it at the, the, the service provider level for water. You have to think about it as far as the environmental actors that are trying to create change. And obviously, you have to think about it at a policy level as well. Unless you have an approach that is trying to tackle this in a cross-sectoral way across many different levels, you are not going to succeed. So staying with the example of Houston, what you see is a new dynamism around solve, trying to solve this very complex problem in a new sort of way. So what have they succeeded o over the last 12 months? This, is a, this has only been going on for 12 months, but they already have some clear successes. So a 30-member steering committee that meets monthly that is truly representational of the community and the cross-sectoral leaders. They've identified a guiding principles and a measurable goal, as you mentioned. They have contributed to the passage of new policy, a new bill that provides an additional $130 million for high-quality pre-K. Now, you may say, oh, Houston, lots of money out there. But we all know that resources are scarce all over the place. So the fact that they would be able, able to, to succeed here was important. 
the, the notion that they have five working groups that are cross-sectoral, that have contributions from people in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, in government, from communities, ends up being really important. They've created and staffed a backbone organization, providing budget for that, and create, having an executive director in, in place. And there is a new level of trust among the participants that didn't exist before. Where there had been conflict in the past, now these groups trust each other to work together for this goal. Doesn't mean that they always agree on everything. That's not the same thing. They disagree, but they disagree in an open manner rather than in a concealed manner trying to undermine the work of each other. And that ends up enormously successful. I mentioned that collective impact is taking parts of the world by storm. We've used collective impact in many places across the United States to tackle problems ranging from issues of juvenile justice in places like the state of New York or in Omaha, things related to maternal child health in places as diverse as California and New York, issues like asthma in Dallas, Texas, but also things like child protection in Cambodia. It's social mobility in Israel. This is a powerful idea, and, it, and it, as I mentioned before, it's taking the world by storm. Now, when we talk about collective impact, we often, I'm gonna skip over this because it's, these are things that you already know, that there are some excellent um, examples of true collaboration in many water projects around the world. But I wanna focus about why we believe collective impact offers something new and powerful to this issue of water systems. So the first is that it, it provides a very structured process for building collaboration. Um, one that's not just on people standing around, getting to know each other, holding hands and saying, isn't the world wonderful? But it's designed to really surface real concerns, real areas of distrust to get beyond that. It involves a landscape assessment that is designed to facilitate a shared understanding of what's needed to solve the problem. And importantly, to test the readiness of those to collaborate. Not everybody is ready to collaborate at first, so what do you need to do to build that trust and build that collaboration in a different way? It offers a framework for stakeholder engagement. It offers a structure for coordinating activities. It has paid staff that's focusing on ensuring the coordination and the momentum forward and building that trust. It has active communication and thought partnership to create an environment that fosters continuous learning and innovation. Now when I talk to groups about collective impact, I often hear two typical responses. And I wanna, I wanna share this, these with you because these may be responses that you're having right now. The first response is people say, oh, we're already doing that. We have cross-sectoral collaboration. We do have meetings. The government is working with the private sector. We do have NGOs that are working with companies. And oftentimes, those beginning elements are there. And that is something that's important, that's a success, that's something that needs, needs to be built on. But collective impact goes further than that because it's really about spending enough time together physically so that everybody who is part of the problem, the users, no matter how humble they may be, feel that they have a stake in creating the success and that they're being heard and that their problems are being addressed and discussed in an authentic way. And it ends up being different in the sense that it empowers people and it energizes people to do things in a different sort of way. In part because they're having those kinds of authentic conversations. And the facilitation of that process to create those authentic conversations is essential for collective impact. So that's one, one thing that I hear. Oh, we're already doing that, we have some collaboration. But I guarantee you that when you see collective impact in action, you will feel that there's something that is different about it. The other reaction that we have is that, oh, it must be magic. We'll wave the magic Harry Potter wand of collective impact and everybody will get, a, get along, everybody will be happy, there won't be any more disagreements. I promise you, it's not that way at all. It is messy, it is painful, it hurts. If you're telling your truth to people that you've disagreed with for 20 years, that hurts. To hear the truth from people that you've disagreed with, that hurts. It's painful and it's messy. So it's not magic at all. But what I can tell you is that the people that are participating in these processes around the country and around the world, and this is not just with FSG, there are many practitioners out there, I wanna be clear about that. What they feel is that something very different and distinct is going on. 
there is a point of departure that feels that it's different and it ends up being transformational. And it has something that I can best describe as having a gravitational pull. Those that have observed process and have said, oh, I'm going to stand on the side because this is too hard, this is too messy, I'm going to do my own thing because I can control that. People that are and organizations that think of the world that way feel the pull to join a collective impact effort because they feel that their efforts and their energy and their time and their resources and their money are going to be better spent in a more powerful way because there really is that common agenda and a structured approach to succeed there. So that's what we feel and, and, and is quite different. In order for this to happen, for collective impact to work, there need to be really five big, big changes. One is that you have to move from thinking about technical solutions to uh, adaptive solutions. There are not technical solutions to, to these sorts of problems. You need to constantly be thinking about adapting. Second is, of course we need to focus on evidence, but let's focus on relationships as well. If you're only focusing on the technical evidence and you're not focusing on building the relationships of very distinct actors, you're not going to succeed to get that energy. The third is content expertise. The people that are working on this do need to be technical experts, but they need to be context experts as well. They need to be able to bridge the gaps and create that energy. There can't be a focus on one single solution, a silver bullet solution, as we say sometimes in English, but we need to think about multifaceted solutions, like I described with the different working groups that are working in a collegial manner to solve the problem. And there needs to be a focus on not hoarding credit. It's not one individual that's going to get credit for it. It's not one organization. It's not one company. It's not one mayor. It's not one governor. It's not one president. This only succeeds when everybody that's involved is actively working to give credit to other people that are involved, because that's one of the things that creates the energy and excitement around them. Thank you very much for your time today, and look forward to answering your questions. <laughs> Gracias, Dan. Eh, ahora vamos a eh, recapitular, recapitular un poco estos conceptos con algunos eh, casos de fondo de agua. Se van a presentar dos, el caso de Brasil y uno de República Dominicana. Vamos a recibir a Fernando Veiga. Tiene más de 25 años de experiencia en Brasil y a nivel internacional promoviendo soluciones basadas, basadas en naturaleza para enfrentar retos vinculados a seguridad hídrica y cambio climático. Ha trabajado en TNC desde enero del 2014. Es gerente de seguridad hídrica de América Latina para TNC y responsa sí, es responsable de su implementación. Tiene un, PH un PhD en desarrollo rural de la Universidad Federal de Río de Janeiro y un BA en agronomía de la Universidad de Sao Paulo. Así que vamos a recibir a, a Fernando. Buen día a todos. Muy bien, buenos días a todos, uh, es un placer enorme estar aquí con todos, muchos amigos, mu muchos compañeros en todo este trabajo, y la idea aquí va a ser básicamente regresar un poco a, a la presentación de Hugo y traer un poquito más de detalles, un poquito más de, de experiencias concretas y un poco cómo la, la, el proceso de los diferentes mecanismos financieros viene siendo establecido en Brasil, con un panorama rápido solo para ilustrar un poquito más eh, especialmente una diapositiva que Hugo mostró en relación a las diferentes eh, posibilidades, ¿no? los diferentes esquemas financieros que tenemos. ¿no? Y aquí utilizando el ejemplo de Brasil, donde hemos trabajado juntos. ¿no? Y aquí una felicidad de ver aquí tantos amigos que hemos trabajado juntos en eso hace bastante tiempo. ¿no? Entonces, vamos. Sí. Eh, bueno, en Brasil, así como en varios otros países ¿no? donde los fondos vienen se estableciendo, vienen se desarrollando, hay una estrecha conexión ¿no? entre el, los retos, ¿no? los desafíos de la seguridad hídrica 
entre las grandes regiones metropolitanas de Brasil, São Paulo, Rio, Brasília, otros, y la conexión con los bosques ¿no? que están ahí eh, en las cuencas altas que suministran agua a esas grandes regiones metropolitanas. Especialmente en Brasil el caso del bosque atlántico es muy fuerte, es muy importante en términos de su conservación, su restauración, para proveer los servicios ambientales que, relacionados al agua, como ya mencionamos acá, cantidad, calidad y regulación del flujo. ¿no? En uh, Brasil, los fondos de agua se establecieron básicamente alrededor del concepto ¿no? de pago por servicios ambientales, especialmente en la idea ¿no? de remuneración por los productores rurales a partir de su trabajo ¿no? de protección y conservación de las cuencas y especialmente atado y conectado a un concepto desarrollado por la Agencia Nacional del Agua, que es el concepto del productor rural, ¿no? de, perdón, productor de, del agua. Y, eh, y aquí ya entrando un poco más eh, directamente en el tema ¿no? de, de la presentación, un poco la reflexión de los estudios de caso, eh, básicamente yo voy a entrar un poquito más de detalle en cada uno de los eh, cuatro esquemas que vamos a mencionar acá. Hay básicamente cuatro grandes modelos de financiamiento eh, en Brasil que yo creo importante ¿no? mencionar acá. El primero sería exactamente cuando tenemos ¿no? los comités de cuenca, Uh, haciendo inversión de parte de sus recursos para garantizar en esquemas ¿no? de pago por servicios ambientales para garantizar eh, agua, agua en calidad y cantidad. Y ahí vamos a hablar un poquito más en las próximas diapositivas. El otro esquema que vamos a mencionar sería los reglamentos legales ¿no? que crean condiciones para esquemas de pagamento por servicios ambientales eh, pagados con recursos públicos, un poco en la lógica como Hugo había mencionado. También, más recientemente, ¿no? hemos entrado fuertemente y estamos ahí en un proceso muy interesante de empresas de agua, o sea, del tema, la discusión de las tarifas, así como en Lima, uh, así como en Perú, así como en Costa Rica, en Brasil también ha avanzado esa discusión en relación a la aplicación de las tarifas, o sea, del, del costo de la conservación de las cuencas en las tarifas. Eh, y, por último, un esquema más privado que los fondos de agua en Brasil han evolucionado y avanzado bastante, que son grandes usuarios del agua participando de privados, ¿no? participando de acción colectiva y pre-competitiva, ¿no? impulsando los fondos eh, y buscando reducir sus riesgos asociados al agua. Un poco, y esto bajo un paraguas llamado Coalición de Ciudades por el Agua, que también vamos a entrar un poquito más en detalle adelante. Ah, en relación a los comités de cuenca, esto fue desde el inicio una de nuestras principales visiones ¿no? en relación a posibilidades de esquema de financiamiento en el caso de Brasil, exactamente porque la Ley Nacional de Lagos en Brasil eh, definió en 1997 que podría haber, o sea, el establecimiento, o sea, que la meta, ¿no? la, 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 gran, la, la misión ¿no? del Comité de Cuencas sería exactamente invertir en la salud de la cuenca, ¿no? eso sería su misión, y que para eso podría estar ahí aplicando ¿no? eh, cobros por el uso del agua de los grandes usuarios. ¿no? Entonces, bajo este, eh, esta, esta, esta posibilidad ¿no? creada por la...